Hello everyone, I'm Agah Karakuzu from Polytechnic Montreal. In this session, I'll try guiding you through some steps to divide and conquer a really complex uh, M script, which is written in MATLAB, but also Octave compatible. I'm a PhD student at Neuropoly Research Lab, copied by my supervisor Nicolas Stikov and Julian Koenadat. My PhD project is about standardization of quantitative MRI methods, which is used for microstructural brain imaging. And I'm trying to achieve this through open source software development. I got involved uh, in this project with QMR Lab, which is a software for fitting and simulating QMRI data. It is natively developed in MATLAB, but also fully Octave compatible. And in Montreal, I'm surrounded by people who love contributing to the community by sharing their code, sharing their data, organizing courses to teach open research practices in neuroscience, such as Brain Hack School by Pierre Belek. And this open environment helped me find out uh, super cool tools about uh, open software development, and which are then translated into creating quantitative MRI pipelines that are transparent from scanner to publication. And I'm also lucky that almost every research branch from our lab ends up developing an open source software. So these are some of the tools developed by the team of Julian Koenadat, in case you're interested, a CT for spinal cord imaging, uh, Axon DeepSec for automatic segmentation of histology images using deep learning, and also a shimming toolbox to correct for MRI field in homogeneities. Apart from my PhD work, I am trying to contribute to science communication as much as I can for MRM highlights, MR pulse, and also for HBM block. Today, I'll show you how we can take a long and complex M script and divide it into modular pieces and wrap some good software practices around it. And in, a, in an attempt to make this online session a little bit less dry, I created a hypothetical case. And let me give you a public disclaimer. Names, characters, and even some of the algorithms involved in this scenario are total products of imagination. Meet Professor Janis. She is the PI of a neuroimaging lab, and she is recently interested in the use of MRI-based microstructural characterization in structural connectivity. And to get the ball rolling, she scans two health subjects and collects diffusion-weighted images along with two structural images, one with magnetization transfer pulse on and one without. Her idea is to calculate a metric called magnetization transfer ratio to inform structural connectome with myelin content. And at the time, a new summer intern visits the lab. His name is Jim. And Jim's find, Jim finds the idea of using MRI to explore human brain organization quite exciting. And he has some experience in MATLAB. Seeing how eager Jim is, Professor Jen says, okay, I will give you some pre-processed data and I want you to use DSI Studio to reconstruct corpus callosum fibers and then use inverse distance weighted eight neighbor interpolation to visualize magnetization transfer ratio values along fibers in MATLAB. Jim says, oh God, what I've done with my summer. With summertime sadness playing on repeat in the background, Jim got comfortable working with MRI data after some hassle and wrote some code that actually gets the work done. And his script, Jim underscore MTR, performs the processing for two subjects and visualizes the results. I mean, which fulfills the expectations of Professor Janice from a summer student. But six months later, Professor Janice collected more MTR data and decided to put together a grant application for, uh, for this project idea. She would like to add Jim's figures to the grant application, but she would also like to make it reproducible with code on GitHub, data on OSF, and results in Binder. 
And after looking at Jim's quotes, she gives up and asks master student Eda to refactor Jim, Jim's quote and make it more open science-y. Eda happily takes on the task uh, to refactor this quote, but at the same time, he, when she looks at the quote, she says, Oh Jim, what have you done? So today, uh, I'll try to emulate what Eda would do and start by exploring the code dependencies and executing the code locally, both on MATLAB and Octave. Then I'll use a brand new tool by Remiga, which is Check My Code, to see how complex is the code written by Jim with some numbers. Then I'll create a clean Git repo, inspect the code to get rid of duplications, unnecessary conditional checks, <clears throat> and cryptic variable names, and I'll write some modular functions. While trying while doing this, I'll try to introduce some tips and tricks that can improve gravity and the performance of your MATLAB code, such as fun operations. These are MATLAB style shorthands that use anonymous functions to boost iterative processes, something similar to list conferences in Python. And you should definitely check this series of tweets by Joe Mezzaro's uh, his 30 days of MATLAB tips he wished he had known in grad school. And I'll also touch upon a thing called implicit expansion, known as broadcasting in Octave. And these are the metrics and array expansions that automatically happen, but may break your code if your MATLAB version is lower than R2016B or your Octave is older than 3.6. So it's definitely worth knowing these uh, version dependent differences. So once we finish refactoring the code, uh, I'll write some unit tests using Mox unit framework to have simultaneous Octave and MATLAB compatibility. And then we will configure a GitHub action that runs these tests at each push to the repo. And when we have our tests ready, we will dockerize the environment and put our code in Jupyter notebooks and make them executable online using Binder. Um, if the time permits, I'll teach you how to configure a simple GitHub action that can build and push a Docker image for every release of your code. Of course, all these things that I just uh, mentioned previously uh, require, Oct require Octave because there is a propri proprietary license issue with MATLAB, but there is a way to create your own MATLAB capable continuous integration service using Azure self-hosted agents. And it is much easier than it sounds, honestly. I wrote a blog post and explained every single detail. You can find it on qmrlab.org. We should also ask ourselves the question, when people look at our code, will they see what we are doing? And these people will probably include ourselves after a month or so because we'll forget what we've written. And styling is really important to write clear scripts. Uh, you can find the PDF of this book, MATLAB Style Guidelines 2.0 by Richard Johnson online. It is a really useful resource and I'll do my best to stick with these guidelines in the course. I'd like to thank all my colleagues in NeuropodyLab with special thanks to Tommy Boschkowski because he provided the data. Uh, I also like to thank Elizabeth Dupre and Greg Kiar for being there for every open source team event. And finally, to Lisa Levitis and Remy Gao for productively organizing this event in such a crazy time of uncertainty. So now let's download the Jim's code and get our hands dirty and start refactoring the spaghetti script. These are the resources that I used to create these nice visuals. Downloaded Jim's. Uh, code from Open Science Framework, and when, when we take a look at the folder, we see one function that probably functions like the main, which is gym underscore mtr dot m, and inside of it there is a variable defined subjects which equals two, and then there is a for loop that iterates over it and displays processing subject number, and then there is an eval function called. That is something you may want to avoid at all costs. Do not use it if that's the only option. And in this case, this is just used to CD, which is 
to navigate into different folders based on the ii iterator coming from the for loop and then there is gym analyze probably the function that does the main thing yeah it plots some figures and then the script uses find object to uh, get the figure objects and save them as png files when it finishes iterating over all folders it says this done and closes all and clears all and in the subject folder we have two png images as we expected these are the outputs corpus callosum 500 tr keys corpus callosum tractography fit 500 fibers in it change ptc courses Line. yeah this is the interpolation function which is given to Jim by one of the PhD students in the lab because they pity it in uh, working on all these complicated stuff on a summer internship and this is the Jim analyze.m the script that we are going to divide and conquer there is empty off and empty on images to calculate that magnetization transfer ratio that as I said in the presentation and there is octave data that is kept in another folder, but this has less number of tracks in it. And text file that contains a fine transformation and two external functions for reading and plotting fiber tracks. In the S2 folder, I see same, same functions repeating with different data. This is not a good practice at all. You, your code base should be capable of dealing with different repositories. You don't have to copy paste them under different repos and then make an external call to them from a for loop to do all these operations on it. And on top of that, we have a different file here called diff fa diffusion fractional anisotropy image. We don't know why it exists. It's a bit encrypted. Anyway, now I'm going to take a look at the MATLAB's project reports. Uh, for, for this session, I'll be using MATLAB R2018B as my main editor. I'm using a MacBook Pro, I'm on OS X. Um, so these functions are highly useful. First thing that I wanna check is the dependency report for this project. And here it says Jim MTR depends on gym analyze we already know that so let's go take a look at the f folder a subject folder and get the dependency report again now we have more details so i'm interested in this gym analyze and it tells me that there is one unknown dependency which is load untouch me so probably jim uh, jim jim has this function the save to his default search path and he forget adding it to the uh, code library when he was uploading it to the open size framework now we gotta find this function online and edit so that we can use it we can see that there are other dependencies on change pts courses the interpolation function track reading and plotting and it says yeah this this also shows which matlab toolboxes you're going to need to run this function in this case we'll need image processing toolbox and then the second useful report is the code analyzer report and for gym analyze we have four messages it says using clear all usually decreases code performance and it's often unnecessary yes it is we have some uh, error warnings from the linter such as do not use this sprint app you can replace it with this function and it says the value assigned to variable trctsfa might be unused another encrypted variable name that is dangling and it also says that the variable tmp appears to change size on every loop iteration consider pre-allocating for speed which is one of the good practices that you may want to follow in matlab do not um, update your variables on the fly create empty variables initialize them and then assign uh, values into them and finally another useful report is a help report so for 
gym analyze there are no description line no help no example no see also line no copyright line which means good luck refactoring that so let's try running this main script gym underscore mtr processing subject one but you can process it because load untouch me is missing okay now we have no option but finding it online so i saved this uh, nifty manipulation file nifty manipulation functions that are also octave friendly on this github repo called mo nifty i'm just simply going to clone this into gymntr so once i clone them i need to add them to the path so say add path mo nifty now we have that function and let's run gym mtr again so yeah now it was able to read the nifty files it specified the origin of it in this case it was zero interesting it loaded 500 tracts and then now it's interpolating magnetization transfer ratio values along those streamlines so this normally was supposed to take about 20 25 seconds but now i'm recording screen it's probably going to take 30 seconds uh, as a side note with this 500 tracts uh, you may not want to even try it on octave because it is taking 30 seconds in matlab but it's going to take 16 minutes on octave 5.2.0 at least on osx um, and there are several reasons why uh, Octave is slow. I will talk about that a bit later on. Um, yeah, now it's processing the second subject. I was planning to show you figures in 3D, but close all and clear all. This is what it does. So let's go back to our folders and check our outputs from S1. We clearly see that this uh, these tracks are not well aligned with the brain image and also the MTR values shows that the half of the tracks are just noise yeah, and this one was probably just to check if the fibers are aligned with the brain in the first case apparently they were but then they weren't for subject 2 yeah looks like fibers are better aligned it is also displayed on FA images with no interpolation. I don't know why. And yeah, this is the alignment check with the MT1 image. Now, before we analyze gym analyze.m, it is time to run this new cool tool by Remga, which is called check my code. Now it's going to uh, go through all the M files in this current directory, and it's going to give us a score called Maccabi code complexity score. If it is higher than 15, we definitely need to consider refactoring that code. And this call, uh, function also is going to tell if the code has any comments in it. So let's see. All right, so what I'm interested in the most is gymanalyze.m. It has the complexity score of 28 and percentage of comments is 3%. We have a difficult task ahead. Let me take a look at the other functions. This is given to Jim by a lab colleague. It has, yeah, it's better. It's 13, at least it's acceptable and has 10% comments. This is an external function. This change PTS courses, whatever it is, it has the code complexity of three and it has a bit more comments in it. So that's something. It also says that you should way too complex refactor them for these functions. So yeah. Now let's take a look at gymanalyze.m. It starts with close all, clear all. There is no need to do this. 
you don't want you, you may want to avoid that you should only deal with variables that you're interested in and in case someone else has some other variables in their workspace you will also get rid of them because this m script doesn't have a function description at the very beginning which means that it is going to be using the base workspace the workspace for the variables of matlab anyway so then it defines two struct three structs for this one there is also fa mp on mp off and fa and it gets the list of all the files with dot me and something else probably dot me and dot me dot gz and then if there are no nifty files it's going to throw an error saying that no empty on file as if it's the only file that may not exist and then after yeah if there are some files it will loop over them oh, and then do a complicated check if there if these files are compressed it is going to decompress them for if it's empty on then it's going to decompress it and load untouched me that empty on file into into the empty underscore on variable it's going to repeat the same thing for empty off and fa if they are zipped and if directory includes some nifty files but they are not compressed then it's just going to go ahead find them and read them into <laughs> now different types of uh, yeah now they are going now it's going to read it into struct so even at the first conditional code block we have some inconsistencies anyway we will take some notes down and leave so we will say that this section is to check if files are compressed or not or if they are nifty with specific names moving on with the inspection we see that mtonprefx field is assigned with some metadata from uh, the struct that is created by the law nifty function and this is the point where it actually displayed the origin from q offset x y and z it gets the origin information into the struct later on and then it's also reading the dimensions from the nifty metadata and then here we see an operation oh we have a comment here thank you jim it says that flip dimensions twice but why we don't know we are yet to understand it so yeah it, it casts, casts the data into double format it is important if you're dealing with quantitative images especially and then first flips the second dimension and then flips the first dimension and gives the size and wait it's doing the exact same thing uh, it did for the MT on for MT off so let's put this duplication notice to make our life easier so I said duplication start it read the metadata double flip flip and then put this mysterious empty of direction hard-coded value and then we see that the same thing is happening for again an FA Philips FA and here they okay I changed my screen recording tool now I'm using gloom and hope that this is gonna be better anyway so here we see a new struct definition plot and then into this plot structure uh, there is a new field assignment for slice which is set to 30 using function round there is no meaning to use round as 30 is already round so there was round here why probably there was a variable that Jim got rid of and it was a leftover function then it defines a new field with capital Z which simply defines a uh, once matrix multiplied by 30 to create an in-plane slice on which we are going to display in our image and also created a mesh grid for that so this is simply create a GK domain to plot 
and then we see that it fetches metadata from MT on image, origin, spacing, and it also initializes uh, new fields, this time lowercase x, y, and z, which is probably going to store transformed uh, indexes. And then along those in-plane axis, it performs a for loop and calls this change PTS courses. So obviously this function is responsible for transforming points from IGK to XYZ when you pass this magic argument. So let's say this is for IGK to XYZ and it is assigning values to the fields that were described here. And yeah, we keep seeing this plot dot direction, this identity matrix many, many times. So this is hard coded. So I will take a note. There is a hard coded identity matrix throughout the script. We'll find that out. And then it takes these uh, intensity from MT on, calls this map to gray function to map grayscale values, and then finally calls figure and uses surf. Because if you'd like to uh, display your image in real world coordinates in 3D, you need to use surface plot. So use surface plot to display image in world coordinates. And then hold on, which means that expect something to be displayed on it. And then we are reading yet another file, which is .trk read fibers. And again, it, get the, it gets the list of uh, all the fibers with trk extent trkey extension this can be trkey or trkey.gz and if empty throws an error blah 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 it's again trying to understand if it's compressed should i decompress it or should i read it directly oh god it's too many unnecessary file checks and then finally when it manages to read that file it says that number to string length of trucks trucks has been loaded so this is the specific line of code that told us 500 tracts has been loaded, which also means that the um, coordinates of the streamlines are stored in this trcks stores streamline coordinates. And then here we are reading some other file, which is, yeah, you see what we had in the folder was transform.txt but obviously Jim had the same file in transform.mat format, so we don't have transform anymore. Read these files. Now we see that there are some operations happening on the uh, fine transformation matrix. It takes the fourth column, the first three rows of the fourth column, which is the translational component of an affine transformation matrix and scales it with the diagonals of the orientation matrix. So it is kind of, yeah, um, update translational component of the affine matrix. Ah, then set scale factor to identity. So yeah, it is, it is just using the information within matrix to change the special location of the fibers uh, in, in world coordinates, but it doesn't want to uh, scale it up or down. It, it, want the, the, it is trying to keep the size of the tracks the same. And then copies those tracks into another variable which is named fa and then here yeah 
it is doing some kind of transformation to the fibers so apply modified transformation to the original fibers and here tracks fa is transformed differently apply transformation to the original fibers again with different transformation we probably won't need this at all because our our main purpose is to do interpolation using mtr values not this domain and then it finally plots fibers and then another duplication to do the same thing on fa image i'll skip that part and here we calculate mtr images by the way i inserted these comments uh, it, it is a super simple calculation here this is how you get your mtr image mt on minus mt off absolute value of it divided by mt off gives you the magnetization transfer contrast that you need to understand the myelin content now once you have this image you need to interpolate uh, mtr values on streamlines and you achieve this by calling this in inverse distance weight in inverse distance weighted 3d interpolation function with tracts and mtr and then you finally um, loop over every single fiber and every single knot again to apply this interpolation and save new scalars as the fourth column of the tracts matrix normally it was uh, it had three columns for x y and z and once we calculate new scalars we are just going to write them into fourth column so that it's going to be uh, recognized as a scalar and this time when we are plotting is when we are calling the trq plot function if you may notice we we, we pass header tracts two empty arguments whatever they are and scalar first so this means that use the first scalar that is written into the tract matrix and display the new fibers so this is how we were getting the images saved in let me find them quickly brain hack gmmtr subject to so yeah these images these are streamlines with mtr values um, written so please don't let this complexity intimidate you because i wrote this code myself um, two days ago and when i was trying to refactor it even i was not able to understand what i what, what i did at some parts of the code but this was kind of exactly the point how can i take a 330 lines long code and create something modular something use, uh, useful out of it and to do that sometimes you, you you may need to read the same code the whole thing a few times but now i have a better feeling of its main components and i think i'm ready to go ahead and create an empty repo to take some notes about what kind of refactoring i'm going to do so I'm creating a new folder called refactor gym and now I'm going to create an empty git repository by having git in it. So now there is a, a version, version control in this uh, folder. Now I'd like to add some files and give this folder a structure and I'll start by putting some empty files. The first one is going to be refactor.md, the file that I'm going to take notes about what kind of refactoring I'm going to do and I'm going to put this at the base of the repo. And then I'm also of course going to create my readme.md file. Um, another good practice is to keep a change log and I would like to keep my uh, scripts in a folder called SRC which is which stands for source 
So I also create that folder, make their SRC another folder to keep external uh, files such as load nifty or those files responsible for reading and plotting tracks. So any code that you'd like to use, but you didn't write. And these are probably living in another GitHub repositories. So I'm also going to show you how to add those modules as sub modules, which is super um, useful to make your code base uh, easier to maintain. Now we are back to our MATLAB editor because we are going to write our first function which is going to be getdata.m so let's save the script under source directory getdata.m as you noticed I follow the camel case because this is what was suggested by the style guidelines if you're writing a MATLAB code uh, the same applies for variable names save it the first thing that I'm going to do is to copy paste a uh, header comment uh, template which is here this is let's let's write a super brief description this script is used to read necessary data and header to perform um, MTR analysis we are going to describe the syntax here and I like this function to give me two outputs the first one is data and the other one is header and as inputs this is going to take empty on image empty off image some fibers and we are also going to add this var argument which means that variable input arguments that we are going to use in parsing them with input parser and for inputs let's type empty on this is nifty file I'm just gonna put super brief descriptions empty off which is again a nifty file and the third one is the fibers this is going to be a tr key file and it's going to give me two outputs data which is going to be a struct containing empty on empty off and fibers header is going to be a struct again containing metadata that points to empty on empty off and fibers <laughs> made a lot of typos and these parameters include uh, we'll come to that once we are done with this M file it says other M files required none and everything. We can just simply skip these parts right now. Uh, if you also have some other functions you want people to see, you can add them here. See also, and you may want to put your email address here so that people can reach out to you if you have if they have any questions regarding your code. And this is June twenty twenty. And yeah, now we can start writing our function. As I did above, I'll quickly define it by function data header is going to give a get data empty on empty off fibers and variable input arguments. All right, so let's first thing first, I'd like to create an input parser so that I can make sure that the variables passed by users are going to be valid and uh, I have an organized way to access everything. 
Uh, in MATLAB, you achieve this by first constructing an object that belongs to the class input parser, and you achieve this doing by simply p equals input parser. That's it. And as I write my code, I am going to insert lots of comments to make it uh, easier for people who are going to read this in the future. So I'll say create input parser object. And also like putting extent of separators to make following code easier. And now I'm going to set my input conditions. And I'm going to allow only the compressed nifty files for the sake of this example. So I'll say I'll only the compressed nifty inputs which means this. And now I'm going to write some anonymous functions to create validation rules. So let me show you how to write uh, anonymous functions. So for nifty validation, let's call that variable well, me and this equals, you put this at x and you use this x as a proxy uh, for the checks that are going to be performed in, in other functions. I think it's going to be, become more, more clear as I write it. So the, the first condition is that I want this mt on to exist as a file. So I put x and put file here. And I also want it to be a nifty file. So I'm just going to check the last three letters in the file name to see if it's NII. And to add it as another condition, I'm just going to add this. Let's do comparison. I'll take X and from AND minus two to AND, which is the last three letters, and see if it is me. So I created a condition as an anonymous function to validate my nifty inputs. I'm going to do the same for tr key files. So now I'm going to say, well, only the compressed um, tr key files. And here I'm going to call this valid tr key. I'm just trying to maintain consistent variable names throughout the script. And in this case, I want this to be a file again, along with the condition of having the extension tr key. Great, so this is super cool. We can create customized uh, input conditions without using any if statements that makes things a bit more complicated. And this input parser uh, can be used in Octave also, which is super nice. Now we are going to set, uh, we are going to tell input parser which inputs are going to be required. And required arguments are positional. So if you see variable names explicitly declared in the function prototype, it means that these are going to be required inputs. And if you have, by rule of thumb, if you have more than three variables, you may wanna uh, add them as a struct so that one struct can contain multiple fields that can be processed by your script. Otherwise your function prototype gets really long for too many required arguments. So now let's add, uh, add required parameters and check for types and to do that we will use at required function and we are going to pass our input parser as the first argument the second one i'm going to put empty on here as i described in the function prototype empty on was the first variable and then the third argument is going to define which checks are going to be performed on this input file and i'm going to put valid me and that's it and I'm gonna do the same thing for empty off 
and this is going to be subjected to the same nifty validation rules with uh, as as Antigon image did and finally it required fibers fibers and this is going to be well tr key once i'm done with required parameters um, i'm going to add some optional parameters and in this case i'd like to pass this um, hard-coded identity matrix that was present throughout the script so apparently i need that information somewhere in uh, in the following functions so i'm going to pass it as an optional argument and to do that uh, i'm going to use a function called add parameter so i'm just quickly type a comment at optional inputs there is also another function called add optional but if you use this it is going to break compatibility with octave so instead of this just use add parameter and p and i'm going to name it orientation and the cool thing is that i can set a default value so if user uh, do not pass a value with as orientation i'm going to have an identity matrix here and my validation rule is going to be is matrix so if you have just one uh, condition to validate your input you can pass it right away as an argument uh, inside of this add parameter function it makes your life easier now finally we are going to parse these inputs parse parameters and to do that we are going to call a function parse we're going to pass our object and now we are going to use these as they are one by one so empty on empty off and fibers and we also have some variable input uh, arguments we are going to pass it as a vector so it's done like this because it's a list of cells if you want to vectorize it you gotta use curly braces so here we go we just wrote an input parser that would take i don't know at least 100 lines of code if we were to use if else and check for different types of uh, conditions so this is super concise and once you get used to it it is a really uh, good addition and you may also uh, ask the question should i write um, an input parser for every type of function the answer is no so if your function is going to be consumed within a for loop this uh, checks can create an unnecessary computational overhead and you may want to avoid it so if you're going if you if you need performance you don't uh, you, you shouldn't add these input parsers so it is meant for the functions that are going to be used by human not by other software pieces let's see this input parser in action and to do that first i need to add everything in my uh, current directory to the search path and to do that i'm going to simply do add path and to include subfolder you can add this generate path and here i'm going to pass pwd which means the current directory and everything in, in this directory is going to be added to the search path and then to test this i can go and check a data folder so let's navigate to this directory and let's copy this so that we remember the function prototype nicely For first time i'm going i'm trying to run this it's going to throw me an error because i didn't complete the whole function and i am asking this function uh, to return two variables called data and header so but i'm going to pass correct input names in it and here we have corpus callosum 500.tr key so when i call it it's going to say argument data and maybe others are not assigned during the call to get data but i'd like to see if my parser works 
To do that, I'm going to set a breakpoint in my code by just simply clicking here. You see that uh, red dot means that your code is going to start executing line by line and it's going to stop here and all the variables in the workspace of this function is going to be accessible through your command window. So let's add one more breakpoint here to show you how it works. So now when, when I call that function once again, and here you can see this little uh, green arrow, it says that it is waiting for my next instruction at this line. And when I click step, it is going to go step by step. And when I click continue, it's going to run everything until the next breakpoint which is the line where we call the parse function. So now here, if you see this K before, uh, before these symbols it means that you are in debug mode. And when I copy paste this parse and execute that line, now if everything went right, I should be able to see my inputs in p.results. For example, for empty on, it gives me empty on dot me for empty off or dot fibers. You can see the fiber file name. Or you remember we also passed a, an optional argument orientation, but I didn't do any. Uh, I didn't add any input arguments for that, so that is just going to show me the default variable. To quit from debug mode, you can simply type db quit here or in the in this window there is quit debugging button that appears so let's uh, do one more call to this function and see how can we um, pass an optional argument to this function and the name of that argument is going to be orientation so i will just add orientation and put some I don't know, random, it's got to be a matrix, so this should work. So here we are again, hit this breakpoint, and it parsed, and when we see our results.orientation, now we will see the custom matrix that we passed instead of the default value. Let's quit from the debug mode and go back to the working directory just so that we know we got that one okay so now once i have a good way of uh, receiving my inputs now i gotta start uh, initializing correct uh, objects to store them and to do that i'm going to use structs because we we have both data different types of data different types of metadata and I like to keep them organized using uh, different fields in, in two structs. One of them is going to be data and the second one is gonna be header. And for while initializing structs, uh, I could have done this data equals struct, but this won't give any clue uh, to people what uh, I'm going to put into this struct. So instead of following that convention, I'm going to explicitly specify which field names are going to be uh, present in my struct. So struct, and the first one is going to be empty on. I don't know what uh, how big that matrix is gonna be so that I'm just going to leave this part empty. If you are sure about uh, the type of data that's going to be loaded in, you can also specify uh, empty, empty matrices or vectors to make your code more performant. The second one is going to be empty of, going to receive some image, and we are also going to receive fibers, which is going to be empty again. So let's say initialize struct for data. Now we initialized our outputs as structs that we know uh, going to have the fields of empty on, empty off, and fibers. 
Now I'd like to add some uh, sub functions to this function that only pertains to this get data functionality. First of them is going to be get nifty header, and the second one is going to be get Philip nifty image because we are not just going to read the image, but we like to flip it. The reason is that when you read nifty data into MATLAB, they have different descriptions of origins. One of them is on the upper left and the other one is on the lower left corner. So you need to flip images to see them in the correct orientation. So I'll just copy paste <clears throat> these functions for get nifty header. I'll just copy paste it. It's simply getting a nifty file and giving us a header output and it is using load nifty header function and it is assigning more useful names to the other fields. So it takes uh, offset x, y, z, for example, and puts it into header dot origin. And then the second function that I'd like to add here is to flip nifty image with some descriptions in it as well. So it says due to differences in MATLAB versus nifty orientation, blah, blah. It's just image double load nifty data and then flip these dimensions as it was done in the Jim's code. All right, now I'm going to use these functions to assign values to the variables that I just initiated. So for empty on, the header is going to be header dot empty on equals get nifty header. And I'm going to get the file name from my parser, which is p dot results dot empty on then I'm gonna do the same thing for empty off because empty off is also an if the file and now I'm also going to do something similar to read my data but this time it's going to be data dot empty on equals get the uh, what's the name of the function um, you get flip me image again p dot results dot mt on i'm going to copy paste the same thing for mt off so as you can see i'm started to showing a pattern when i'm doing same thing multiple times uh, and just changing variable names whenever you feel like you're repeating something you're duplicating function calls but the only thing that is changing variable names and especially if they are changing in a systematic way as we are doing here you should probably write a simple for loop to handle this this kind of input case right so obviously uh, the determinant factor here is that if my inputs are nifty i can loop through this p that results mt on field and see if I can call them. But how am I going to know uh, these are going to be associated with nifty files? I'm just going to simply create a list called nifty list and it's going to be a list of cells and the first one is going to be empty on, the second one is going to be empty off. Oops. Right? And then I'm going to iterate these items and look for it in the in the objects of p.results so i'm going to say for i my this is how you should define your iterators by the way the most common one you will see is i i which is definitely not understandable or if you use i matlab is using the same notation for complex numbers so you may want to avoid it so i'm just going to simply say i i is going to start from one and it's going to go to the length of my nifty list. As you can see, there is a consistency between the name of the iterator and the list that it's going to iterate over. And I'm going to get the current name. I just say name is going to be nifty list. You gotta use curly braces again to access the uh, index stored in a cell, and it's going to be take my iterator. Now I'm going to simply check if this is not empty if uh, yeah p dot results so now i'm going to check if p dot results 
contain something that belongs to the nifty list but how am i going to take that one uh, string and use it as um, dynamically accessing to a field in a struct to you to do that in matlab you can simply use parentheses and then when you type name here it will do that check for you so this is really useful i use it a lot if you know these tricks you are not going to you feel the urge to use eval or some other kind of circumventing functions to do these operations so now i set my condition so then if this happens i'm just going to say that okay now i know that this is a nifty file and i have some simple rules to read nifty files so i'm just going to read header dot name is going to be equal to get nifty uh, header in this case p dot results dot name right and remember that i also like to inject some other metadata which was called orientation and this is a great place to do that because i i just want to uh, access them in nifty files so i'm just going to say header dot uh, name dot orientation now i'm adding a new subfield to that and it's going to be p dot results dot orientation i hope this is not boring i'm just repeating things on hoping that they are going to become more clear and finally i also like to store the file name that is passed to the uh, input which is useful and that's going to be the name itself and finally i'm going to read the data data dot name oops not like this like this data that name is going to be equal get flip nifty image p dot results dot name yeah that's it now we can delete these lines and we don't have any repetition and another cool thing is that this is scalable for example in future i'd like to use the same function but i will have other nifty files required let's say FA, I just need to do this, nothing more. If I add FA here and to my function prototype, my uh, my function is just going to simply read it without any other additions. So this is also good for modularity. And the last thing that we need to do is to read inputs for the trucks, fibers, and it has just one simple function, which is TR key read. And here in TR key fibers. How did we define that name? As we we called that p dot results dot fibers. And here header dot fibers and data dot fibers. So that's it. We wrote a function, finally with header, input parser. By initializing our outputs, and then. Um, reading our nifty files read nifty i'm going to add more comments to these codes later on so when you're reading them from a repo i hope that this is going to be more clear and on purpose i'm going to leave many of these functions without uh, any header in, in information or any comments and kindly ask you to make pull requests to my repository to create a more understandable uh, code base so that we can at least some interactivity. Yeah, that's it. We have our first function, get data. So I took advantage of recording this online and uh, edit all other functions that I'd like to create with, during my refactoring process under the source directory. Um, because otherwise it would be really boring to show you what to what to do specifically in each of them. So first, uh, let's go back to the get data m, and remember that there were some functions such as this low nifty header or functions to read our fibers that were added externally to Jim's uh, to Jim's code. 
So what I'd like to do is to find those repos and add them as sub modules to our repo. And I collected all those uh, relevant links. Remember that the, we had an external directory here. This is where we are going to host uh, all those functions as sub modules. And to add a sub module, I just simply say git uh, sub module add, and I will now copy paste the repository URL for check my code. And then I am going to say where I am going to put this function in my repository. In this case, I want to place this under external folder and I'll call the name of that folder check my code and I pass recursive, oops, not this one, and use shallow submodules so that I don't need every uh, branch and every commit. I just want to get the latest one commit. So that now it's cloning it into the external check my code. And I also would like to add nifty library so i'm going to do the same thing git submodule add this external slash no not a octave nifty i will call this and recursive shallow submodules And there is one more library. This is for reading and writing uh, our fibers. Again, git submodule add this to external, um, I don't know, let's call it TR key tools, recursive shallow submodule. Now it's fetching the repo. Cool, let's see now what, what we have uh, in our external directory. As you can see, we have MATLAB Octave Nifty, check my code with a typo as usual, and track tools. And everything we want is available here. But the thing is, um, let's Let's see um, which submodules we have, and it is git submodule uh, helper list. Yes, so it, it says that we have three submodules added with these specific commit hash, hashes to our repository, um, and when we push it, it is really not going to push them to GitHub as files, but it's just going to push this information so that GitHub is going to know that these are submodules and it's going to point to other repositories. So when you're cloning a repo that has submodules, when you do git clone URL, you will only get the codes that belong to that repo. If you'd like to clone repository with submodules, you need to do git clone URL dash dash recursive just a additional information so now I'm going back to my uh, editor now that I have my uh, dependencies and external I need to add these to my search path so again add path Cool, now I'm going to try my get data function and see what it gives. And to do that, I need to navigate to a directory that contains some data. I have some data here, yes. And let's see, uh, mt on that readme. And empty off and 
surface close when U500 dots TR key. All right. So now we called our function and we have two variables. One of them is data and the second one is header. Let's see what we have in data. Data dot, we see fibers empty on and empty off. Let's see uh, what do we have in data dot empty on and I don't know, here. Cool, we have a brain image. So, and also in the header information, we again have the exact same field name. So there is this consistency that's gonna make our life much easier. Header.mtOn, for example, has fields name, orientation, origin, size, and spacing. If you remember, we injected these uh, metadata while loading the file names. And now when we get origin, yeah, this origin for this data was zero, zero, zero. This is nice. So uh, I want to show you some other things regarding functions before writing tests. And there is something I added in this transform fibers, trans, no, transform fibers function. So before in Jim's repo, we had this nested for loops to iterate over uh, every uh, array in this this fibers variable so maybe i should show you this um fibers is going to be data dot fibers and when we check the type of the fibers it's a struct array and to access um, elements of a struct array let's say this trq1 equals you you need to in this fashion so we know that truck one is a fiber that uh, that has uh, 193 nodes with these coordinates so in in this part of the code I am looping through the length of fibers and in each fiber I'm also looping through nodes and one bad thing about looping too much is that your code on octave is going to become much more smaller, uh, slower. And this is because of two reasons. One of them is that to do vector and matrix oper uh, operations, by default, MATLAB is using something called uh, Intel's MAT kernel library, whereas Octave is using something open source. So it's a bit slower than what Intel provides. And the second important thing is that um, MATLAB has a better um, architecture to understand loop logics uh, in your code so that it can execute them faster. Anyway, these are probably too much detail. Um, so instead of writing a nested loop, I used array fun. So the function of uh, this array fun is to execute a function on each element of an array. In this case, our array is a struct array. And as you can see here, we have that anonymous function again. So it tells that, okay, perform this action on X, which is fibers, and assign its output to this variable called TMP. And here I defined another small function to do that transformation. You can write the function between these parentheses, but if it's something a bit longer, you should better write it here. Now I will take a closer look at this array fun at the line 45. If you remember in the presentation, I told you that there are fun functions and there was a, a series of blog posts about it. So I think this is a, a good place to talk about them a bit. Um, before we refactor the code, this operation, um, yeah, that was a nested for loop to transform fibers, is now performed by a single line of code, which is called array fun. So first, let's see um, how it's going to operate by breaking a, uh, placing a breakpoint at line 53 and calling the necessary functions. First, 
I will read the data and the affine transformation that I need to call this function transform fibers and then I will call the function itself by passing fibers origin information and the affine transform to it and we see that the function executed in 0.01 seconds which is pretty fast and how long would it take if we were to execute this function in an old fashion? Let's see it. So yeah, the new one time folded uh, the old one in terms of speed. But this is this may not be always the case with uh, array function. Uh, probably there was something worse going on in the uh, code that we refactored so that we see that array function improved the performance a lot but this is this may not be the generic case all the time anyway uh, i'm going to add a lot of uh, tips and tricks about uh, how to improve the performance of your matlab code in this transform fibers.m uh, you can find them in the repository and that that content is going to include things like vectorization the most important thing is pre-allocation, implicit expansion, and found functions. So anyway, what is this array fund doing in here? We see that it begins with an anonymous function description again. It says that, okay, I'm going to run this function on X as a proxy of fibers variable. And then we also see uniform output false. So you set this to false if the anonymous function is going to return outputs that are not equal in size so that uh, the array fund is going to store them as a cell array. But if you set this to true, then you assume that uh, every single return from that function is going to be equal in size. And here, uh, our anonymous function is calling a sub-function called TFM, which is described here. I did this just to um, keep this line shorter. And remember that there is always a trade-off between um, the speed and the readability of your code. Sometimes while you're trying to optimize performance too much, you may sacrifice lots of uh, clarity. So you may also want to avoid that. It's really a matter of trying to find the fine, uh, fine tuning. Anyway, um, this array fun steps into this TFM and this is where I'd like to talk about this implicit expansion. So let's see it in action. Um, I'll call that, what, not this one. Um, yeah, I will click from this debug mode first. And, all right. Now we are in this particular line where implicit expansion happens. So when we take a look at this code, uh, code single line of code, uh, it does matrix times transform. So our matrix in here is um, 110 by three. And normally you can multiply this by a three by three matrix. So that's normally happens. Let's see what it gives. Let's see, it's equals to C. And yeah, variable C is going to be again 110 by 3. But then here is the weird thing. Size of this variable is 1 by 3. And somehow we can add C with this 1 by 3 variable. And we get a result. So let's see output equals um, C plus transform. As you can see, it gave us another uh, variable which is 110 by 3. So MATLAB understood that we are trying to expand the 1 by 3 vector. Uh, you, along this singleton dimension to match the size of this 110 by 3 matrix. Maybe I can give you a simpler example. If A were equal to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
and b was something like 10 times 10. And I would be able to do this a plus b, which would give me this. This is also the uh, equivalent of ESX fund and a plus a b. So this function is available for MATLAB versions older than R2016 b. But if I try to do this a plus b in uh, MATLAB R2015 a, let's say, it's going to break. And the same applies for Octave for versions 3.6.0. After putting this much effort in refactoring a spaghetti code into something modular, you probably don't want anyone else to push a commit and break your code and or you also don't want to introduce a bug that changes the destiny of everything in your repository. Um, to prevent that, uh, we are going to write some unit tests which are an important part of the continuous integration process that not only ensures that the new changes that you introduce to your repo is going is not going to break anything, but you can also make sure that the magnitude of changes in your outputs are not going to exceed a certain threshold. Because you may not receive a runtime error, but it wouldn't make any sense if your new inputs are, I don't know, like two times higher than what they were before. And to introduce tests to our repo, I am going to use uh, this repository called Moxed Unit. It is a XUnit framework for MATLAB and Octave. Let me quickly check uh, defining Mox unit, unit tests using this specific framework. We need to start our test with this header, so I copied it. I'm going to create a new function. I'm going to test our um, get data function. So I'm going to name this get data test. Let's save this under test director. I already put our test data here, but normally we, the, this data is not going to be a part of your repository because you shouldn't uh, store big binaries in a Git repository. It's not a good practice. Instead, uh, I'm going to push these files to open science framework and I, when I'm running these tests on a remote server, I'm going to add necessary steps to tell the, uh, which data to download before running my tests. But right now, let's just uh, keep it under test folder to see how testing works locally. So I just saved it. That's the header part. The only thing that you need to change is this function name, otherwise MATLAB is going to complain. Now I'm going to write uh, a function Let's say function test loader. And every time I'm going to tell it where is uh, where is my data. So to do that, I'll come in with find me where I will call the data directory. And in this case, it's in just subfolder main test data. And I'm also going to add this file set, which is uh, forward slash if if MATLAB is running on Ubuntu and backward slash if it's running on a Windows system. And then let's put a message. Um, testing get data function. So we know what's running. But I'm already looking at the log. Now I'm going to call my get data function with empty on, empty off, and test fibers.tr key. And yeah, let's save it and run it. On my computer, I have Mox unit library saved to my default path, but this is not going to be a part of this repo because we will be using GitHub Actions that already has this Mox unit test. So I created something comprehensive to run Octave tests on GitHub Actions. I forked this from this repository but I, I added some other functionalities to be able to load some Octave packages, add some data directory and some other cool features that can make testing with Octave 
on GitHub much better. Um, yeah, I define this little test. I'm going to call mox unit run tests. Great, it passed because we just merely called the function and didn't do anything more. Now let's see if these outputs are exactly the same with what I saved in the test data directory. And here I have my test data. This is test get data .mat. Let's see with uh, if variables of data and header in this previously saved uh, mat file is going to be equal to the new ones. Um, I'll clear that from the scope. And to do that, I of course need to first load them. So I'm going to call them saved. And then I'm going to put some assertion tests that are also a part of the mox unit framework. This is called assert equal. And here I called my data data loaded and header loaded. These are the new ones. I'm going to check if data loaded dot um, fibers are equal to save dot data dot fibers. I'm going to repeat the same thing for other fields in my data, which is empty on and save that data dot empty on. Let's run our test again and see if it's going to pass. So yeah, it passed again. But if I do to this data somewhere in between, let's say we introduced a new change uh, during a comet, and it did something like um, this. Data loaded that empty on now equals to data loaded that empty on plus one. So now this assertion test is going to fail. As you can see, it says that these elements are not equal. First input, this and double, and yeah, this is going to prevent us from doing wrong things while we are committing new, while we are pushing new commits to our repository. Um, I'm not going to show you how to write one test per function. You can find all the tests in the repository and I will add a lot of comments and detailed explanations in the readme file and I'll be also um, ready to answer your questions. You can uh, feel free to open GitHub issues regarding anything that I explained up to this point because it's probably too much to digest uh, in one session but I really like to do my best to show you all uh, uh, everything that is possible that you can do with MATLAB and Octave. So now in the next step, we are going to uh, add our tests in GitHub Actions. This is going to be the repository that I'm going to provide you for uh, BrainHack 2020. It's called EDA Organized because remember the name of the master student was EDA who refactored the code and everything. So let's take a look at this project structure again. Of course, I added many more things. And yeah, let's let's start with this refactoring.md to remember what we were up to. So we said that we will divide and conquer and we did the divide part. We took that one long script and created all these other functions, despite that I just only showed you how to do it for get data, otherwise it's impossible to do it in about an hour. And then we have the conquer part. And for this one, we create a test data that I already did and gave it to you, but I can definitely answer your questions regarding how to create a test data. For example, uh, one important thing is that you may, you, you should 
generally put a part of your data because you don't want your continuous integration server to run tests for a long time because I told you that the running the same function on Octave for 500 fibers takes about 15-16 minutes. It is too much for a test step. Instead, if you provide it with 10 fibers, it should happen in 2 or 3 minutes, which is quite acceptable for a CI test. And then upload test data to OSF, which I already also did. Write tests per function and ensure that they perform assertion checks. This is also done. Tests will be placed in a folder named tests. Check. And then configure a GitHub action to run tests with coverage in Octave. Now this is what we are, go what we are going to do. Let me show you. Let's see what do we have uh, under test directory first. As you can see now, we have one test per function. And in uh, each, each, each one of them, I call the related function. In this one, it's change coordinate system. And once I get the outputs from it, I do assertion tests to see if they are, the, they, they are consistent with the old ones. Now, um, I want these tests to run whenever I push a commit to this repository. And I want these beautiful badges uh, show me what's going on. So right now when I take a look at it, it says that there is code coverage of 100%. So this means that um, the code that you write, um, every line, uh, every single line of that code is hit by some uh, unit tests. So you covered the whole uh, basis of your repository with tests. And the second badge is telling us that the continuous integration is passing. This information is coming from GitHub. And the second one is telling you that Azure pipeline succeeded. So this is also a continuous integration type, the continuous integration test, which was run in MATLAB. So I will begin with CI tests on Octave. Um, just show me the badge, thank you. Um, is it this? No. Okay. So you can see that I pushed many commits to this repo and some of them were passed, some of them were failing, depending on what kind of changes I was doing to prepare this repository. Um, let's take a look at one of the tests, one of the recent ones that passed and see what kind of output it gives. So there is a build process and here, this is the log. Um, so it, it's going to create a test environment, which is based on a Docker, func uh, Docker image uh, from QMR Lab Octave, Octave CI version 4.2.2. Um, I assume that you have some uh, little information about Docker containers. And then I check out this repository because um, after you push a commit, you need to check out that repo to be able to test latest changes. Then there is a step download and extract test data. I will show you how this is done. I put a script called download test data dot sh. It's a simple SHA script. And then it is running uh, Agah Karakuzu Mox Unit Action Master. This is doing the testing using that Mox Unit framework and doing the coverage test using mockup. As you can see, I loaded image and IO packages. They have an asterisk next to them. And here it is change coordinate system test passed, get data passed, and every single one of our tests passed, and it says, okay, pass six, unit test succeeded, yay. And then once this test is completed, it creates an XML file, and it is passed to cut co co coverage, and I'm also gonna show how to do this, and it returns information to the badge in our readme repository. But how do we set this up? Um, for GitHub Actions, you create a special directory, which is .github slash workflows in your repo. And here, you put some YAML files. 
in this one I named MoxyML, but you can name it anything you like. And this is the description. So it says on each push to the master branch, I'm going to start a job which is named build and this job is going to run on a Ubuntu machine and the steps are going to include check out the repository with sub modules this is important in our case because we have some sub modules let me show them just to quickly remind you and see how they look on github so normal folders that you place look like this whereas sub modules has this arrow so and they are associated with some uh, certain commits this is a nice way to understand if uh, a directory contains sub modules or default files so once it checks out our repo in the next step it's it's going to download and extract test data and i'm going i'm passing a it a variable from github workspace whatever it is i i can explain it later and i'm running a single command sh download test data dot sh let me show you this download test data here it is so it's super simple it's if um, this variable with this environment variable is available and no, if this variable is not available, then it assumes that you're downloading this data to your local machine. If not, it is downloading data for GitHub Actions. And this is the download link. The rest is just wget or curl, depending on which one of them are available. You can definitely take this SHA script, use it as a template, and just change this download link uh, when you're doing for your, for something for your own. So let's visit this uh, repo on OSF, of course, without that. Yeah. This is Jim's MTR analysis uh, open science framework project that I set up. And you can find all the relevant data in here under a director. There's actual data with two subject and also the test data which is a bit smaller than the original one okay once we downloaded and extracted our test data to a specific directory that is defined in the shell script and in the next step we are calling this uh, mox unit action on our repository to do the testing all we need to do is to create this uh, descriptions we say uses agakarakuzumokjunit at master with source src as source data and to test data we are going to use the files that are downloaded under test test data octave packages that would like to load our image and io and we have some uh, external dependencies that would like to add to our path we just simply pass it here and if we also want coverage, why not? We should uh, we should want a test coverage. We just say okay with coverage true, and give the XML file a name coverage XML. And then in the next uh, action step, we are going to call the one from, one by the code call. Um, this is code call .io. You should have um, an account here to log in. It's just more than enough if you have a GitHub a repository. And as you can see, a DA organized repo is associated with this. And it's totally free. Uh, here, I use this token, but you don't have to use it. This is not required for public repositories. And here, you just need to say, Okay, which XML file should should this service check? It is coverage.xml. And then the rest is just fixed. And it gets the thing done to get your coverage report. It uploads that XML file on your account. And you can see that 
100% of our uh, repository is covered for every single file sitting on the source directory and you can also see the lines that are hit one by one by these tests so it's really good let's say you didn't cover some of the lines you will uh, know exactly what to do to get more test coverage so that's it all it takes is to place a well-defined yaml file under github under workflows in moxunet.yaml or runmytest.yaml and then when you push a commit let's push a commit to the readme file these are the badges um, this is a test commit let's see it in action I'm just going to commit these changes and when I click actions tab you will see the commit and when you click it you can follow the whole process sometimes it queues may take a few minutes to set up and start a job but it's usually super fast now it's pulling a docker image that is about uh, 500 megabytes and it's usually happening super fast and then it's going to run these actions and complete our tests if I push anything that breaks it uh, we will see that continuous integration test is failing um, I also told you that there is another test running on MATLAB site and this is using the self-hosted agent that I set up in one of the computers in our lab but let's see what it does If you'd like to have something like this, you will need to set up your own server and I will also put the link to my blog post uh, explaining uh, how to do that. So MATLAB test has already finished because it's 10 times faster than it is in Octave. And here we also have uh, check my code reports. So you can see the code complexities uh, of the new additions that we put as you can see these are all acceptable but this one because I didn't put much effort in that one get data has sub functions has com code complexity of 5 1 it has 47 percent of comments so we can definitely make these much better and for the tests we see that all the tests passed so now we know that this code is going to run on MATLAB and it's also going to run on Octave for the tested versions of course and to set up these Azure pipelines uh, you also put a YAML file at the base of your repo in this case you will just say trigger this workflow when there is an event on master and as pull it says default but this is a Ubuntu workstation in our lab and then for the steps, it checks out the repository again with submodules true and just run this MATLAB script to do the test. And that's it. All right. So we divided our script into smaller functions and each of them uh, are now responsible with a certain task. Then we started conquering uh, the spaghetti code uh, by writing unit tests for each function and creating a GitHub repository. Now we have version control. And then we hooked a continuous uh, integration service to our repository using GitHub Actions. It's here, one with uh, Octave, and we see that it's passing. And it also uses cut, uh, code coverage, so it shows that the 100% of uh, all the codes that we written so far are covered by tests. Uh, we add one more service, this time running continuous integration tests in MATLAB using the Azure self-hosted agents. 
and it also has this beautiful check my code functionality. I think Navar code deserves um, a good user interface that can be executed online using Binder. And this interface is of course Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, I will add all the installation instructions in this readme file later on about how to run your MATLAB Octave code in a Jupyter Notebook or how to get them running in Octave, uh, in Docker or using repo to Docker and everything. You can find all the instructions in, in, in this repo later on. Um, but when it comes to creating environment descriptions to use Octave and Binder, Docker files are my favorite solution because I already created and pushed some Docker images to Docker Hub to make my life easier because I'm uh, working on Octave a lot. We are creating interactive tutorials and everything, and I don't want to deal with different dep dependencies in each and every time. So I created both Python and Octave environments that are living together in a Docker image. And each time I like to create a, a binder link, I point my uh, I point to that Docker image. Um, another solution with Binder Hub to de describe an environment is to use configuration files. So these are some custom files such as requirements.txt, environment.yaml, or runtime.txt and such. Um, so when you point a repository to Binder Hub, two directories are checked. Uh, the first one is the root of your repository. And the second one, the, the, the second option is to have a folder called binder. So I use this option to keep things a bit more organized. And as you can see, I provided a Docker file and another file called post build on purpose because uh, when you provide binder with a Docker file, every other configuration file is ignored, such as post build. But of course, there are some tricks that you can pull inside of your Docker file to uh, make them a part of your uh, environment build. So let's see what's inside this Docker file. This first from instruction is really, really important because it tells Docker Builder uh, which foundation to use. Here I am using QMR Labs uh, Octave Jupyter Notebook image, which comes with Octave 4.2.2, um, Octave kernel to use Octave and notebooks, some Octave packages that is useful for neuroimaging, such as uh, IO image optimization and statistics toolbox. And I also add some interactive visualization libraries in Python, such as Plotly, and it has SciPy, uh, Pandas, and some other useful Python tools to uh, read MATLAB data into Python as well. And the second instruction we see is add. And as you can see, it says add point homework. So this tells Docker to copy everything in the repo to the work folder under home directory. And then the run command you see here on the 16th line is to execute bash comments during the build. As in, yeah, you can think this uh, as running a comment in your Ubuntu terminal. It does basically the same thing. Here, uh, I read this post build file line by line and execute every comment in it. This is just to download uh, the data from Open Science Framework and decompress them to the environment. I will show you that uh, script as well. And finally, we set a, a working directory to the folder where our content lives. So this is going to be the folder uh, that Jupyter Hub is going to serve when our binder session starts. And that's it. I mean, all it takes is five lines. It's actually four lines or three lines. You, you, you don't really need to add your data into your Docker image to get a fully functional Octave notebook running on cloud. And yeah, just let me quickly show you this post build script. 
I usually don't add uh, too much data in my Docker images or I don't put too much data in the GitHub repository. It's not a good practice. Normally I would use this post build as actually a post build script that runs after Docker image is completed. But in this case, I may, made an exception because our data is not that big. It's about 40, 50 megabytes. So I first uh, download the input data using wget and then unzip that. And the third one, I included test data as well in case you'd like to play with it. All right, so to binderize this repo, now uh, we will copy paste this URL. We are going to visit mybinder.org, one of the uh, binder service providers. You can see other options here uh, there is one on Guesses, Turing Institute, or OVH. They are all running different binder instances. And here I will paste this repo, the repo URL, and you can easily copy paste, uh, copy your link from here and paste it to your readme file so that people will know that that repository has binder. So let's hit this launch button and it will start a build. And we can see build logs here. It already cached uh, many things from my build, including the Docker image and everything. So this is going to happen pretty fast. As you can see now, it's downloading our data. It finished building it and it's already pushing the image. Oh, it happened super fast. Uh, but as it is building, uh, I will show you my notebooks from my local. But let's remember how it all started with this long, unnecessarily complicated, and if I may say, ugly script with zero commands. And now we have a beautiful notebook that can execute on cloud and it has environment descriptions and everything in it with modular functions. So I think this was a nice use uh, showcase uh, about how can we divide and conquer a script. But I added disclaimers left and right about the sanity of this analysis. Just please remember that I created this repo and every single line of code in it to showcase uh, a simple scenario. So please do not use this particular special alignment or interpolation approach in a pipeline. But if you are willing to add quantitative MRI in your work, just tell me, I can point you to much better resources. So let's run our code. The first cell is to turn off Octave's warnings because it's super verbose. It likes printing lots of warning messages that you normally don't see in MATLAB. Uh, to keep my cell outputs clean, uh, once, I done, once I'm done with developing the notebook, I run this one particular command. And then we need to navigate to the home Jovian work directory first in this notebook because that's where our uh, init and initializing script lives. This is responsible for adding everything we need to the Octave search path and also loading Octave packages that we need. So let's run this. As you can see, a lot of struct, IO stats, uh, and some other packages, and successfully added everything to system pad. And now I'm going to use uh, the data located under a subject to directory of edad data that is automatically uh, pulled to the Jupyter Hub session, as we described in our Docker file. So I describe my data directory. Sorry, this is much slower than it normally is. Yeah. And now remember the get data function. We will now read our data from data directory we just specified, which are MT on, MT off, and 50 corpus callosum fibers because this is running in Octave. And uh, if, we, if we were to load the one with 500 tracks in it, it would execute in about 15 minutes, which is really not nice. But there are lots of practices in the code, so you can always try making it faster. So it loaded, loaded our data. Let's see what's in the MT on and MT on image. As you can see, it's a simple 
uh, images plot to see two slices and then we read our affine transformation from transform.txt if you remember we were transforming our fibers let's do it and then yeah um, I will uh, show the original the, the tracks that are loaded on a single slice but in Octave these 3D plots are not uh, showing really good if you're on a notebook so it's just going to give me something super funny and in the meantime um, I'd like to talk about another good software practice which is not to reinvent the wheel yeah this is how it looks like but don't worry I have a much better visualiza visualization surprise for you so even for the simplest quantitative MRI methods there are different ways that you can calculate a quantitative map and even for MTR which is just a ratio some people multiply it with 100 some people take absolute values some people abstract the MT on from off versus off from on so if there is a package to do this kind of analysis I try to include um, their function into my repo and in this case remember that we down, uh, we created this docker image from QMR Labs uh, docker image so we can use QMR Lab easily to calculate our MTR image so here we load the data and fit and it also has an in inbuilt function to display outputs in a nice dynamic range because printing quantitative maps can be a bit tricky and it also gives you a function to save uh, fit results along with nifty uh, along with a new nifty file that has in the that is in the same space as, uh, with one of the parent files and it's also a really good practice to specify when you are saving something to which folder uh, to save that data now we have our mtr data as a variable and now we are going to do this inverse distance weighted in interpolation with mtr so this is probably going to take some time to do it and then we are going to save our fibers um, yeah so this is it uh, we can easily expand this analysis for multi subjects given that now we have uh, good functions responsible for one specific task so yeah it finished interpolation and now i'm going to save them in dot mat format uh, there is one important thing uh, while you are saving dot mat files with octave you need to pass this um, dash mat 7 binary argument otherwise you won't be able to read mat files you write in octave in matlab so yeah this is the operation so now let's took a, take a look at the interactive visualizations um, for this one i loaded the .mat files i saved before and i saved one uh, from matlab by interpolating 500 tracks so that we have a better visual I loaded few Python libraries in here, SciPy, NumPy, and Plotly to read and manipulate these images. So I'm not going to go through this function. It is doing something pretty similar to what I was doing in the NetLab uh, function. And this is what we get. A 3D interactive plot that shows nodal MTR values interpolated on the fibers and when we hover we can actually see MTR values along those fibers and everything it's really good but here as I this is this was the reason why I was uh, really really cautious about uh, warning you not to use this script in your analysis as you can see these are corpus callosum fibers but in the interpolated region I clearly see brain ventricle uh, ventricle patterns so probably my fibers were not good registered to the anatomical image along the longitudinal axis so this is anyway for nodal MTR values and we can also visualize um, average MTR values per tract in this fashion and we can explore them one by one so yeah um, that's it uh, I hope this is going to be useful 
I will add one last component to the repository, which is to build and push a Docker image to Docker Hub every time you make a release. But I'm not going to talk about specific uh, of it right now. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in how to do that kind of thing after you read my instructions, I'm more than happy to help you. So I think this was, yeah, that's it. This is the end of my talk. Thank you so much and looking forward to meeting you online soon. Do other people yes. see us at the moment or? Yes, we are live this, at four. Okay. 43 people are okay. seeing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> questions that ask. Okay. I can hear myself from other computers, so I shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. First question asked to you from Jeram Bakdal. Uh, told that can you tell me again the difference between git clone and git sub modules you explained within comments but if you want to elaborate mm -hmm. on that feel free yeah i mean the comment wise what git clone and git sub module does are totally different git clone is to uh, get download a remote repository to your local machine Whereas Git submodules, uh, which is usually used with Git add submodules to add other GitHub repositories as a part of your project. Yeah. Thank you. The and exception... yeah, the important, the, the, sorry, the, the only important thing with Git clone and submodule is that if a repository that includes, uh, if you're cloning a repository that includes submodules, you need to pass dash dash recursive uh, mm. argument to your git clone call so that your download is going to include all those submodules. Otherwise, they will be omitted. Oh, yeah, that's the trick. Uh, Octo handles, uh, it's a question from Remy. Uh, Octo handles input parser are exactly the same way I think I ran into issues in the past. Octo version issue. Mm -hmm. And you elaborated on the answers, but I'm not sure about understanding that. I did, but I can talk about a bit more about, um, yeah. about the keeping your MATLAB and Octave uh, up to date with each other. Despite that the Octave is an open source clone of MATLAB, uh, when you're trying to implement new things, you will always run into some issues. Some of the functions won't be available. Um, so if that's the case, if you know how to write that function, you, you should definitely go back and contribute to Octave to it, that functionality. If not, you may find some workaround solutions to do that in Octave by writing small scripts. And sometimes, the, for example, for this input parser, it's, it's available both on Octave and MATLAB, but there are some differences between two of them. So you, you should really try and fail to understand if the same thing is happening on both ends. And this is one of the reasons why, if you're able to do your continuous integration tests both on Octave and MATLAB, and see if they provide the similar outputs in both ends. So yeah, that's, that's a bit more advanced use case probably. But yeah, Thank you. mostly input parsers are compatible between MATLAB and Octave right now. Thank you. I'm going through the questions in, in the order of the ask. So we are going back to submodules and Remy said, why do people hate submodules so much? Do people hate it? I, I yeah. mean, I definitely don't hate submodules. Um, if anything, adding something to your repository as a submodule is a much better way to um, stick with the op open source development practices. So I can definitely go ahead and clone a repository to my local, get rid of the Git uh, directories in it, and keep the license and copy paste everything into my repo. But then how am I going to know that which exact version or from at which exact um, commit well, I copy paste it into my repository. That information may be totally lost because you may not have an explicit declaration of your versions in the repository. So for some people put a version.txt at the base of, at the root of their repo, I'm one of them. But if that doesn't exist and, and you copy pasted everything and then you found a bug in it, but you don't exactly know which commit to trace back. So to that end, using submodules is useful 
And I think it's also a good way to give credit to other people in your repo. You can just yeah. click to that folder and go and check uh, what they are developing these days. Really cool. Uh, um, Remy also, as you mentioned using camel case, I know the answer to that one, but what other types of cases are there and why should we use them? Mm -hmm. So in MATLAB, it's mostly camel cases, and there are a few exceptions to that. For example, by, while you're defining a struct, uh, the first letter is capitalized as well, and then the fields are going to follow the camel case. Um, and there are cases that you may want to use all capitals if you're declaring some global variables. It, you shouldn't too much. Uh, yeah, all these things are really uh, explained in super good detail in the in the uh, MATLAB Styles Guideline 2.0. I provided the link uh, as an answer to that question, by the way. Thank you. And this is the last question. Yeah. So uh, you are basically using submodules to cover the, the lack of MATLAB package manager and environment manager. Yeah. Um, MATLAB now has something called projects. So you can definitely develop a MATLAB code and other people can easily add it to their MATLAB project to build on top of that or use it as a submodule. Um, but uh, can you still hear me? I think you're disconnected or I am disconnected. Hello. <laughs> you are live. Sorry, I just did something wrong. Hey. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, you are, you were live all the time. I just oh, okay, uh, okay, your, your connection. Is just, okay, yeah. Um, but I I usually choose not to um, stick with that project structure because it's not Octave friendly sometimes. So hmm. if you're trying to do things in MATLAB way too much, then you will sacrifice some Octave compatibility. And I always want to keep that because I want to give and easy for people to execute my scripts online, even if it's smaller, even if it's working with a sub portion of the data, it doesn't matter. So yeah, um, you can create MATLAB projects, but you should also think about Octave. Okay. Like that. Mm, what's, what was the MATLAB link? Let me, let me find uh, it. Yeah, that's the link and if there are any other questions, please ask. These were the questions asked during the first part of the video. And I checked that there is no ad additional questions for the second part. So feel free mm -hmm. to ask your questions right now. Yeah, I was actually a bit surprised not to receive any questions from all the continuous integration and other parts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, there, there should be some questions. If not, if everything was clear, that's amazing. It's usually not the case. <laughs> it was true, but it's really one of the straightforward thoughts that uh, I listened because it's normally really boring to watch people coding, but you're all so fun. I enjoyed the talk. Really? I, I thought that I was really boring. I um, towards at the end of the second uh, second hour, I thought that people would fall asleep. Even I had to drink lots of coffee to keep myself awake. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's been really amazing that it, to keep you in the chat. So, thank you. And thank I'm you. not seeing any other questions, so I'm just uh, closing this session to start a, another the other uh, stream. Right. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, feel free to open GitHub issues and go through those practices. This is, I'm more than happy to help your questions on Mattermost or on GitHub, whichever you prefer all the time, even Perfect. next week or so. All right. <laughs> Perfect. See you around. Thank you so then. much. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. Ending this broadcast.